Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's VORI's webinar. Thank you for participating in our discussion today on community bank loan workouts. Today's session is the first of five in VORI's third annual commercial loan workout webinar series. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets that you can use. All of the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them through the private Q&A widget without disturbance to the program. If you are having technical issues, you can find answers to common technical troubles located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen, or you may submit a question via the Q&A widget. An on-demand version of the webinar will be available shortly after the program and can be, a, can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. This program has been approved for one hour of CLE credit for Ohio. To receive credit, please fill out the survey widget and be sure to include your bar number. Finally, as a reminder, this webinar is for general information purposes only and should not be regarded as legal advice. As always, you should contact your VORI's attorney if you want more information or have questions about how these developments apply to your situation. Now for opening remarks and introductions, I will turn it over to Brian Farkas, partner at Forey Stater, Seymour and Peace. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for taking the time to join us for our third annual commercial loan workout series. Um, today, we are gonna be looking at specific issues for community bank loan workouts. Um, this will, this will cover issues that affect a lot of our financial institutions, not just community banks. So if you're a regional or national bank on the line, um, we understand you're here and there, there definitely is overlap and will be added value um, to, to um, let you know where we're going with the program. I'm gonna be covering uh, the first part, which is credit audits and due diligence before a workout uh, I'll then cover loan modification and forbearance agreements. Uh, my partner, I'll then turn my the program over to my partner, Nikki Workman, who's gonna be covering LIBOR cessation issues. And then finally, Carrie Brocious will be covering rights and remedies um, that you can exercise if a workout uh, cannot be com completed through a forbearance or modification agreement. So to start off, um, when a credit comes to work out or you're the relationship manager on the line and you get first signs of distress uh, from your borrower, what's the first thing that should be done? Well, our, we believe the best course of action is to audit all your credit documents. Um, obviously, before you can even formulate a strategy on whether you're going to do a workout or whether you're gonna liquidate or some other strategy, you first need to know what you have. And you also need to know what you don't have. Um, the uh, a borrower in distress generally, uh, I, it's akin to almost being in the emergency room. If you're a doctor, uh, there's all sorts of problems, there's all sorts of noise. And um, between both the debtor and management at the bank, there's often a need to move quickly. And we understand that and, and the bank generally needs to make decisions in a very timely manner. However, that should not be a, uh, a, any, a, a justifiable reason for not doing an audit of the credit file and making sure as the officer in charge of this credit that um, you haven't uh, been a, that you haven't done a full uh, investigation as to where the credit is where are your leverage points and where are some of your vulnerabilities? So the, the first thing is, and, and most, many banks have this, and, and we, we often create these, is it's very helpful for your, before you jump into a, a credit audit, is to develop some sort of internal checklist that's um, comprehensive so that it covers all the documents, um, the due diligence list normally includes going over your notes, guarantees, mortgages, security agreements, insurance, environmental indemnities, uh, whether it's a, a, a real estate loan, a CNI loan, there's gonna be different things you're looking for, but you wanna make sure that everything in the loan file that you expect to be there is there. 
And so many times having a due diligence checklist as you're going through the loan file is very helpful so you can just check off and make sure uh, you, you've done a comprehensive review of the file. Um, one of the other things I want to point out on this slide, obviously, you know, documents being properly executed, uh, that includes notarizations. There are some documents like mortgages, they have to be notar notarized. Uh, obviously, in the, in the file, if, if a document needs to be recorded, make sure you have a recorded copy of that document in your file. And if you don't, uh, you need to get one and make sure it was recorded properly. Um, enforceable Cognova provisions. Um, most people are aware of this. This, this is something I think if, if you got a highlighter out, this is one you want to highlight. Um, Cognova provisions are probably one of the strongest leverage points you have uh, if you ever have to go into enforcement mode and enforce your documents. Uh, brief, a brief background of Cognova, if you have proper Cognova provisions and you have those originals and you need the original blue or, or wet ink signed documents uh, to, to enforce a Cognova, it allows you to go directly into court, get a judgment, many times on the day you file that document and get judgment liens and execute immediately against your 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 debtor borrower and any guarantors so looking for enforceable cognova provisions making sure you have those original documents that's a huge item that you want to make sure is 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 properly executed and you have so that again in in the event you do need to exercise your rights and remedies you're going to have a valid Cognova provision uh, to execute on. Um, the next issue is, is collateral and perfection issues. Uh, I think many times when, when the more complicated the credit, the more vulnerable it is to having perfection or, or, or security agreements not written properly so that they're, they're vulnerable to attack. Um, you want to make sure your UCCs properly identify your collateral. A lot of times we've seen, you know, the loan agreement includes all assets, but unfortunately the UC, well, or, or vice versa, the UCC says all assets, but the security agreement covers just equipment. Um, you you want to make sure that this is an opportunity to look at your doc, to look at your documents and make sure all the collateral that you believe should, should be included is there. Um, and then missing documents. You, you want to investigate into the file and make sure, you know, if you have any vehicles or equipment as, and, and they are certificated that you have the original certificates of title. Um, if you don't have the orig original certificates of title, now is the time to get them. Um, and again, well, current financials, a lot of times in these files, uh, we don't have financial statements from the borrower. A lot of times the personal guarantors um, haven't produced financial statements, personal financial statements in years. Now is the time to update the file, get it into uh, current shape so that any documents that are outdated, you get current updated uh, documents uh, for, for them. And then finally here, identify all material communications. Um, we need, you know, sometimes as a workout officer or, or as a new loan officer to a credit, if this gets thrown your way, you're coming into the middle of a story. Uh, and so you want to make sure you're caught up with where this credit's been, what was the underwriting, what was the basis of, of, of the underwriting for this credit, and what has been, have there been any commitments made by the bank and or the borrower regarding issues in the past that have come through or haven't come through so that you understand exactly where this credit fits and everything's in context. Um, and, and this next slide, um, again, uh, if you're getting this, if you're getting this credit transferred, which a lot of banks have that policy when a, when a loan is, is, is getting downgraded, it gets, either thrown over to a special assets officer or a new relationship manager. If you're the new person, make sure you speak uh, to the prior relationship manager. Uh, they can be a great source of information. They can help you understand what got your borrower uh, downgraded. 
you know, was it a COVID related issue? Is it, are they, ha is this customer going through seasonality issues? Um, or does this borrower just have a really bad business model that they've failed to correct? Um, the other issue to look out for when you when you when you're auditing the credit files, look for any potential lender liability issues or potential claims that our borrower might be able to assert against the bank. Um, now, this is both past things that are, have happened, or these are things also you should be careful not to do yourself uh, as you continue with this credit, right? right? Um, oral promises or course of dealing. Um, you wanna make sure that the verbiage that's been used in past conversations didn't create any commitments or obligations on the bank. Speaking with the prior relationship manager, you can confirm that. And then you wanna make sure too, that when you're speaking with your borrower, you let them know that you represent the bank. The bank has a decision process in which management approval for any decision on this credit is going to be needed and that you can't make promises uh, on behalf of the bank. The, the bank has a structure in place to do that. Um, you also want to, I, I think a good policy is, you know, if you're doing any, uh, having any phone conversations with the borrower, uh, you make sure to confirm those conversations in writing so that you can document the file that no commitments have been made and that at this point you're just investigating and trying to get all the information regarding this this credit. Um, this this the, the last on this the last issue on this slide is litigation with customers or competing creditors. When speaking with the, the relationship manager or your borrower, find out what's going on with its customers or any competing creditors or any other litigation that might be going on. Um, the, this is one issue that we have seen a lot of where the borrower's major uh, major source of distress is being occupied with litigation regarding some major issues. One of the questions we frequently get asked is should, should the special assets officer or new relationship manager meet with the borrower? Well, generally we think it does make sense to meet with the borrower. Um, the most important reason why is because um, it gives the borrower an opportunity to tell their story. And um, it, 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 as the bank, we want to look reasonable. We want to look humane. Um, if we're ever in front of a judge because we did decide to exercise our rights and remedies, we really don't want to be in a position where the borrower is telling the judge or jury, this bank wouldn't even give me the courtesy of meeting with me. So it's, it's also a good just defensive play in the event we end up in court. Um, but the other thing I think it does for the bank is when you meet with uh, your borrower in person, they will give you uh, a certain element of transparency about what's going on in their operations that you might not get in an email or over the phone. And it gives them the opportunity, it gives you the opportunity to get a complete picture of what's going on. Um, I think it also gives you the opportunity to establish ground rules, you know, that you're there you, you can only help the borrower if the borrower is transparent, honest, and brings problems to you immediately. And again, you can, you can reemphasize that, 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 that those are necessary conditions for you guys to even, for the bank to even consider a workout. And then it also allows you to again explain to them that you can't independently make a decision on your own whether or not there's going, what type of workout, what kind of terms there are going to be in any type of agreement, or if there will be an agreement, and explain the bank's structure of there's generally uh, an approval committee that's going to have to give final approval on anything that's discussed. Uh, and then finally, one of the things, whenever we're, we're talking with our borrower, whether it's an email, whether it's internal emails, we need to stay professional on all those communications. Um, one of the things I think, you know, every now and then we get, we see an internal, even an internal email between uh, bank to lenders regarding uh, the borrower that may not depict the borrower in the best of light. Um, obviously, uh, use your best judgment on how that, that verbiage is used so that if it's ever published in a courtroom, we're not embarrassed by the, the language we chose. Um, 
And also, as part of the audit process and due diligence, as you get a new file, you want to you want to do generally if you've got personal property collateral, you want to make sure to do UCC searches. If you've got real estate as part of your collateral, do title searches. Um, you also want to do judgment lien searches. See if anybody has any judgment liens against your property, uh, your property collateral. And then also you want to obviously make sure there are no tax liens out there. So you want to do tax lien searches. Um, some other reports that you may want to consider doing, credit reports. That will tell you what the unsecured debt looks like. Um, Asset reports are helpful because those will tell you if any, your borrower or guarantors have any other additional assets that they maybe can be included as collateral to shore up some of these uh, distressed facilities. Um, litigation searches. And, and one last thing on litigation searches, and, and we'll touch on it again, you want to make sure those include bankruptcy searches so you know if any of your guarantors, especially or your borrower uh, have filed for bankruptcy. Um, generally, you should have received, your bank should have received notice of that, but if it did not, it's, this is a belt and suspenders ways to find out if any of your guarantors or borrowers have filed for bankruptcy. Loan amendments and modification agreements. So once you've done your, your due diligence and you've examined the file and you've seen you know, what the credit looks like, where are your leverage points, where are your vulnerabilities, are there things we need to clean up with these credits? If you now decide to go in the direction of amending the loan documents, um, there's generally, we like to think of when, you, when you're going to amend, there's, there's different reason to amend the documents, but we like our, our lenders to think about the amendment process as a as a way to strategize and improve the bank's position in the with the credit. So it's not simply, you know, we need to extend this for internal reasons because it's month end and you know it's going to go non accrual. We want to think a little bit deeper about the the matter that how can we get this credit in the best position so that not only can they thrive and survive and get out of workout and hopefully either get refinanced out or get back to the line. But how can we put the bank in the best position so that in the, un, in the unfortunate event, the, the borrower is not rehabilitated, the bank's in the best position. It's got the most collateral, the most solid documents that it can enforce its rights and remedies and um, be in the best position possible if it has to go in that direction. Um, on this slide, you know, some, some of the things we have seen sometimes it, that banks have done is, you know, it's generally not the best idea to amend documents if the, the borrower's business has no future and there's really no strategic advantage uh, to amending the documents. Um, if we're just prolonging the inevitable and we're not going to get anything out of the amendment process, it's probably not the best idea to do that. Um, but again, if, if we're able to improve our position and we can use it as a strategy to, to get us where we want to get to, um, it can be very powerful. Um, interesting, the, the, you know, forbearance agreements, loan modification agreements, amendments, um, the, the, they all have different names. A lot of times they have the same substantive effect. However, there is some window dressing here and borrowers sometimes cringe at the word forbearance agreement and they prefer a loan modification agreement. Um, and then sometimes, you know, we put everything in an amendment and that, you know, the, the way you, you present the, um, the verbiage to the borrower, sometimes you want to think about it because it does send a message and you want to make sure you're managing those perce perceptions accurately. Um, one of the, once you, you you choose your document, whether it's a forbearance agreement, a uh, loan modification agreement, or, or other document, um, you want to make sure there's some standard terms and, and features that you have in all of these documents. You want um, to start off. You want to make sure that the borrower acknowledges and 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 and, and is affirming that they're in default, um, and that the bank has the right to exercise its its remedies based on this default. 
Um, you want to obviously be explicit about how long, if you're doing a forbearance, how long is the forbearance or how long is the maturity date going to be extended? Um, you also want them to reaffirm what collateral is there securing the loan. Um, you want to draw up a, a, a history so that there's absolutely no ambiguity as to all the things that have happened that have led to this new document being executed. And so that there's so that the borrower is signing and affirming that all these things are true and you don't have to argue with the borrower later on if there was indeed a default at this time. Um, this last thing, the release and waiver, the release provision, um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen an amendment uh, to a loan document that doesn't contain a release of claims. Um, this is another provision. I, if, you, if, you're, if you're doing any highlighting of, of, of slides or, or writing, taking notes, getting a release anytime you touch documents should be a must. There, there shouldn't be a bank document that changes um, or, or, or allow, gives a concession to a borrower that does not contain a release. And you want to make it as broad as possible so that it releases the bank of any of all claims uh, that the borrower and or the guarantor could assert. Um, financial covenants, a lot of times in amendments or loan modification documents, we introduce tighter financial covenants, more reporting. Um, you want to make sure cash flow monitoring, any cash flow, uh, you want to you want to make sure the the bank is monitoring and understands exactly where it's going. Um, COVID relief, you want to make sure any PPP loans are being forgiven and your borrower is not going to have any issues with those. Um, cash flow restrictions, um, you, a, lot, a lot of times there's subordinated debt or, or, or um, uh, shareholder loans. You want to make sure that there's restrictions or at the very least you're comfortable with what payments are being paid outside of your obligations. Um, this last, uh, this last uh, item on this slide, the retention of turnaround consultants. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, we have two situations where we generally see consultants. One is where the borrower, um, you know, the bank doesn't feel comfortable that the borrower is, complete, is disclosing a complete financial picture and so the bank wants to bring someone in to, uh, as a third party to get that transparency that it's hoping for. Or two, you've got a borrower that has a, a, a business management style that isn't getting the job done, and you're hoping a third party can come in and help, um, turn, help, help this borrower turn things around. Um, you want to be careful, though, retaining consultants is an area that's fraught with lender liability issues. You wanna make sure that when you're documenting how these turnaround consultants are being hired, that you're, the bank isn't imposing a certain person to control the borrower on behalf of the bank. Uh, because I, we've had a lot of situations where you know, consultants come in and the borrowers, if things go south and you know, a certain period of time with that consultant's advice, the borrower's gonna to wanna to turn around and blame the bank for requiring that consultant. So there's there's ways to do it uh, where, where, where you uh, diminish or minimize the liability, um, generally recommending you know, three different consultants and having the borrower choose, and then having the borrower sign the agreement with that consultant and uh, agreeing ahead of time that they're not being forced or coerced by the bank to hire that person uh, is a great way to uh, prevent lend or, or minimize lender liability concerns at the, at the front end. Um, and then lastly, uh, again, in thinking of modification agreements and forbearances as a strategic document so that you're improving the bank's position, this last slide that I'm gonna cover, again, adding guarantors, adding collateral, uh, cross defaulting your documents, cross collateralizing them, are all very important things that you can do to improve the bank's position and to solidify uh, things now while you are changing the documents. Um, rem remedying lean perfection issues, obviously, if there's a perfection issue, this is a great time to clean it up. Um, and then you can 
you can obviously one of the one of the things we see a lot of is putting automatic right to a receiver uh, and having the borrower waiving any objection to a receiver if things don't get turned around uh, by the time the modification matures, the forbearance period ends. Um, and then lastly, uh, fees. Um, obviously, we, you know, this is costing the bank money to hold these credits. You want to make sure you're charging fees to, uh, to, to compensate the bank for the credit. And then also, you want to set payment hurdles or, or um, whatever, whatever desired outcome you're looking for. If it's refinancing within six months, put provisions in your documents to incentivize your borrower monetarily to reach that desired outcome. So, you know, maybe it's a waiver of default interest uh, if they get refinanced and the bank paid in full within six months. Um, or maybe it's the reverse. Maybe they have to incur a fifty thousand dollar fee uh, at maturity, in addition to the, the the documents maturing, if they don't get the bank refinanced, uh, you know, within that period. So, again, in thinking strategically, um, mo modification agreements and forbearances can be a great way to get the bank in a better position and. Um, uh, if you ever have to, if you ever have to liquidate or enforce provisions in a litigation setting later, the bank will ha will be much better off after you've you you've uh, completed a, a solid forbearance workout arrangement. Um, with that, I will turn it over to my partner Nikki Workman, who will be talking about my work. Thanks, Brian. Um, everyone's favorite topic, or maybe just mine, but thanks for indulging me. Um, I, as Brian said, I'm a partner at the finance group um, at the firm and am part of our working group uh, working to help our bank clients and our borrower clients on LIBOR cessation issues. So um, we're just going to talk briefly today about LIBOR cessation. This is not meant to be a LIBOR cessation 101 program. If you are interested in that kind of programming, we actually have some webinars that we've previously done that you could reach out to someone at the firm and we could provide you with that information. Um, and, and also too, as um, already mentioned at the top of the hour, this is not meant to be accounting tax, SEC reporting or other regulatory advice. So um, a lot of this is highly uh, dependent on your tax accounting um, or regulatory situation. We've been working with a number of our bank clients, uh, primarily through our legal departments, to look at LIBOR cessation issues, including building in robust fallback language, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and also identifying replacement rates um, that um, ultimately will replace LIBOR in the various loan documents. A um, quick check, and this is probably for the Voris team, it looks dark on my screen. Everybody good with the view here? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Good job. All right. So first question, you may be thinking, this is a program on loan workouts. What in the world does LIBOR cessation have to do with loan workouts? And the answer is LIBOR cessation has to do with everything right now. Um, <clears throat> it is at the top of um, everyone's minds in the finance world. And for loan workouts in particular, all kidding aside, it is an opportunity where you are revisiting the loan documents with the borrower. So as Brian just went through, there are various um, uh, degrees of workout. So from an amendment um, to reset covenants and maybe some charge a fee all the way to, all right, you know, we're going to do a forbearance agreement to the point where, hey, we need you refinanced out in six months. So there are different varieties. And in certain situations, you may be doing a workout where you're intending the borrower to remain longer term, um, in which case, you know, you, you'd certainly want to deal with the LIBOR cessation issue. But but even more so in the short term, nobody knows what's going to happen um, with, with the workout. And you may intend for that borrower to be refinanced out in six months. But I think we've all experienced situations where that doesn't happen for some reason or another. So we certainly don't want to be in a situation where um, the agreement does not have appropriate LIBOR fallbacks. Um, all right. So again, this is not a LIBOR 101, very brief history. Um, most of you probably know this, but during and following the financial crisis, allegations of LIBOR manipulation caused concerns in the market about the reliability and robustness of LIBOR. So one thing you may or may not know, I think it's, it's sometimes surprising how many people don't actually know how LIBOR um, has 
how LIBOR is calculated. LIBOR is not based on actual transactions. It's based on quotations submitted by a group of panel banks. So um, it's not based on a robust set of market data. And again, it's, it's based solely on, uh, on quotations that are submitted. Um, and so as a result of the allegations of uh, manipulation, regulators started thinking about a replacement to LIBOR. So where we are now is LIBOR, the regulators have um, stated that they expect banks not to enter into any new LIBOR contracts. And right now I'm speaking U.S. specifically. Um, and there are a separate set of considerations for um, international loans, which we won't get into today. But in the U.S. in particular, the regulators have said they will consider it to be a safety and soundness issue for a bank to continue entering into LIBOR loans after the end of this year. So that's December 31st, 2021. Um, one development um, that the market wasn't necessarily expecting came in early March, um, where the ICE Benchmark Association, along with the FCA, which is its regulator in the UK, announced that they would continue to compel panel banks to submit um, quotations of LIBOR, US dollar LIBOR, other than one week and two months, um, until June of 2023. So that gave the market some relief to deal with what we call legacy contracts. So that is existing those are existing contracts based on LIBOR, whether it be a loan or a swap or something else. Um, but there's been a little bit of confusion. That does not mean banks can enter into new LIBOR loans after the end of this year. It just means they have until the summer of 2023 to remediate existing LIBOR contracts. Um, so that is the, uh, the those are the timetables within what we are within which we're working right now. Um, here's a slide for your reference. I've already talked about most of this, but. Um, some key milestones. Again, keep in mind, you've got December 31st, 2021. The bank should cease making any new LIBOR loans uh, or enter into any new LIBOR swaps. Um, and then again, you have until the summer of 2023 to remediate existing contracts. Uh, one note that's important on the remediation front, though, is that um, we are not expecting banks to wait until June of 2023 to remediate all their contracts at once. So what we've heard from a number of our bank clients is that they're expecting to spend um, the better part of next year, so 2022, um, replacing LIBOR in existing contracts, even if there is appropriate fallback language. So we'll talk about fallbacks in just a minute. Um, but the fallbacks themselves were not designed to be operative. They are designed to truly be a fallback. And the regulators envision actually that um, rather than relying on those fallbacks, that the loan agreements actually get proactively amended to take them from LIBOR to whatever the replacement rate is going to be. So I do think we'll see a lot of amendment activity um, next year for non-workout type loans, just as ordinary course renewals um, come, or if there's a credit asked by the borrower, I think the banks will take the opportunity at that point to, to talk with the borrower about, all right, we've got LIBOR in your contract, we're going to be opening it up. You're going to make an acquisition. We're going to make a new term loan. At this point, let's talk about the replacement rate and actually put it in the document rather than relying on this fallback language. So what should banks be focused on now? Again, if you're interested, we have an entire webinar that we did in January that talks uh, in more detail about a number of these things. So if, if you're interested, please reach out to someone on the Boris team and we can get you this content. Um, but as mentioned, from a key milestone perspective, as soon as possible, banks should cease making any new LIBOR loans. Um, one other thing that's critical, and I, I know a number of you on this call are likely uh, workout professionals or lenders at banks, um, and a lot of this fa is falling on your legal department or your, and or your operations teams um, to identify the rate or rates that banks will use to replace LIBOR. So one very recent development um, to just update you in case you're hearing these bu these buzzwords as you're talking with your borrower. Until about six weeks ago, everybody was pretty convinced that SOFR was going to be the replacement rate for LIBOR, at least in the near term. Um, there have been a number of developments since then. Um, right now, the only, uh, well, there are two different varieties of SOFR, well, three actually, that are available, and that's um, Daily Simple SOFR, which is an overnight rate. Um, there are SOFR averages, which are which are published averages. They're 30, 90, and 180. So if you if you looked at a SOFR average rate today for 30 days, it would be the average on a compounded basis of that rate over the last 30 days. And there's also a compounded uh, SOFR in arrear. And the way that that SOFR uh, rate is calculated is you take your interest period. Let's say it's May 1st to May 31st you um, compound the rate over that entire interest period, and then you uh, 
you know what your rate is going to be or the total interest that's payable at the end of the interest period. So one of the major issues that's been articulated about SOFR from the beginning is that SOFR right now is not a forward-looking rate. It doesn't function like LIBOR. Um, of course, there's an overnight LIBOR rate that a lot of banks use, but a lot of banks use the LIBOR contract or the term LIBOR structure where a borrower will borrow today and they will borrow at three-month LIBOR and their interest rate will be set today for the next three months. At the end of that three-month period, the rate will reset for another three months and then it'll reset for another three months. So one of the major benefits to borrowers is they know in advance what their interest rate liability is likely to be, um, specifically for term loans where the, the principal doesn't fluctuate like a, like a revolver would. Um, and one of the major issues the market has articulated with respect to SOFR is that that term structure doesn't exist yet. And the regulators um, ARC have indicated that they, they intend to develop term SOFR. It doesn't exist yet. And about six weeks ago on a symposium that they put on, uh, they announced that they expected a limited use case for term SOFR. And what that did was send the market really into a frenzy looking for alternatives to SOFR, um, specifically something with a term structure and that really brought to the forefront two other indices that we've now started to hear a lot about, one of which is Ameribor. So you, you can see these on your screen. Um, Ameribor has been around uh, for quite some time and has been part of this LIBOR replacement discussion for a while, but didn't really gain a lot of traction until recently. And in fact, um, a couple of weeks ago, Zions Bank, which is a regional bank based um, out of the, I think the mountain states, announced that it was intending to replace almost all of its non-syndicated loans with Ameribor, um, which was you know, the first of that kind of announcement that we've seen from a bank of any size. Um, Busby, BSBY, which is another rate that's published by Bloomberg, which has a term structure that um, has really gained traction in the last few weeks. Um, just yesterday, news broke that both Bank of America and JP Morgan have executed um, swaps based on the Bloomberg short-term bank yield index, which is what BSBY stands for. Um, and there are a couple other credit sensitive rates as well. One is published by ICE and there's another one published by IHS market. So all of this is to say that if you thought uh, the race was over in terms of LIBOR replacement and SOFR was going to be the rate, um, yeah, I think we will be living in a multi-rate environment for a while. So what does that mean for you? So you are a, a commercial loan workout officer for your bank. You're in the middle of a workout with your borrower right now and your credit agreement has LIBOR. What do you do? Uh, your first call, I think, should be to your legal department to understand what uh, the bank is doing with respect to LIBOR, what the bank's current guidance is on um, when it expects to replace LIBOR, what the appropriate fallback language is. Um, you know, banks have different uh, versions of the language they promulgated. So most banks have communicated with their internal and external legal partners to say, this is the language that should be included in your contract, the fallback language, which will say, in the event that LIBOR um, ceases to exist, here is either the rate that's going to replace it, or here's the process by which we are going to designate that replacement rate. So again, I think a key takeaway for you is to know that all of this remains in incredible flux, um, and you should be talking with your legal department as you're working through these to understand um, how they're thinking about LIBOR replacement. Um, I've touched on a lot of this already, um, hot topics um, in LIBOR cessation, which you know really just gets me out of bed every morning. Um, as I mentioned, there are different varieties of SOFR that are available now. There are these various credit sensitive rates that I think you'll continue to see covered more and more frequently in the news. Um, and then of course, don't forget about Prime. Um, that is a rate that's been around uh, forever and most loan agreements reference Prime, um, sometimes not as a borrowing option, but as a fallback. So a lot of loan agreements are already drafted to say, um, if LIBOR is unavailable, then the, the, the rate's gonna kick to Prime. Um, most borrowers don't like that though, because prime tends to be a higher rate. So that that tends to not be a satisfactory resolution in the long term. In a workout situation, you know, maybe you decide, look, once LIBOR goes away, we're going to kick this to prime, or we're just going to take this straight to prime. Um, and then of course there are fixed rates. So you know, we we don't often see fixed rate loans. We do see them sometimes. Um, I know we've heard from some some smaller banks who have said. We don't want to mess with SOFR. We don't want to mess with the Maribor. We're just going to price everything at prime or they're actually revisiting fixed rate loans. So I think, you know, you'll see some talk around that as well. I think 
you know, one major hot topic, and we, as I mentioned, uh, work with banks and borrowers on these issues, what we're hearing from our borrowers directly, as well as anything you read. Borrowers are reporting that they are not hearing from their banks in a sufficient way on this topic. They want to know what is happening. They want to know what their replacement rate is going to be. So, you know, I think that's another key takeaway for folks is to be communicating with your borrowers. And if the answer is we're not sure yet, it's better to communicate that than to not say anything at all. All right, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Carrie and um, take it away. Thank you, Nikki. I'm going to very quickly try to cover uh, collection rights that are available to a lender or any creditor um, that are either by contract or by the statute. Before you start to contemplate what collection rights you're gonna exercise though, take a step back. Confirm that you actually have an event of default under the contract. Confirm that you have complied with all notice requirements and confirm that you have allowed all cure periods to expire. Once you have done that, then you are free to explore the wonderful world of collections. And your contractual rights typically will include mortgage foreclosures, receiverships, account debtor collections, repossessions, secured party sales, and set offs. I'm going to pretty much skip mortgage foreclosures and receiverships. Those are going to vary not only state to state, but if you practice in Ohio or if you lend in Ohio, you'll know that mortgage foreclosures can even vary county to county based upon what counties expect um, when filing and proceeding to sale. And if you're exercising either one of those remedies, you've already obtained outside counsel and they're gonna be able to best guide you to what other circumstances you're facing with your particular case. So the first up is um, account debtor collections. Basically, if, um, if a borrower has granted a lender a security interest in the, in the borrower's um, accounts receivables, if there's an event of default, the secured party or the lender may directly collect from the account debtors. So basically the UCC provides that once a secured creditor gives notice to an account debtor that um, there has been an assignment and that it's collecting payment, the account debtor is required to pay the secured party. If the account debtor pays the borrower instead, the secured party will find itself in a position where, or excuse me, if the account debtor pays the borrower instead, the account debtor will find itself in a position where it may have to pay twice. First, the borrower, which it incorrectly paid, and now the secured party. One thing to think of when you are in that phase that Brian Fark has talked about in the loan modifications doing the forbearance agreement, if your collateral primarily consists of account receivables, look at the information that the bank has pertaining to the borrower's accounts receivables. What information are you getting through the door? This is your opportunity to shore up, are you getting the AR agent reports monthly? Are those reports actually helpful? Did they obtain all the information you need to actually collect the debt, should you have to? Again, your success on collecting your borrower's accounts receivables is going to depend on what information you have available to you. Now, when it comes to issuing the notice to the account debtors, it's pretty simple. You basically just have to advise the account debtor of the assignment of what actually was assigned. Best practices is to typically include a UCC financing statement. If your UCC financing statement is one of those general ones that just says all assets, that's when you're gonna to have to work a little bit harder in your notice to make sure you explicitly explain that this account has been assigned and you are entitled to collect the account. One thing to keep in mind as the secured party trying to collect the UCC provides that the account debtor can come back to you and request further information to request that you further authenticate your security interest. Including the UCC financing statement is a way to minimize the number of requests you get back from account debtors. But just keep in mind that if you get a request back asking for additional information, you must respond to it. Repossession is another um, collection right that's available to you if there's a security contract, if there's an assignment or um, a security agreement that provides a security interest in something such as inventory, equipment, or some other tangible asset. When it comes to re repossession, there's three ways to go about doing it in general. There's the self-help requiring that the debtor assemble and deliver the collateral in the judicial process. 
when it comes to self-help and with respect to the debtor assembling and delivering the collateral. These must be done without breaching the peace. And it should be noted that the statute, the UCC, does not define breaching the peace. You have to fall back on case law. And you'll find that case law is very broad and it favors the debtor. There's case law out there that says picking up the collateral over the oral objection of the debtor will constitute breaching the peace. So if there's any pushback, even the most mild pushback whatsoever, the best course of action is to secease, is to basically secease operations and then commence a judicial process. Typically, this judicial process is going to be a replevin action where you're going to get a court order that uh, directs the uh, borrower to turn the equipment over to you or where the sheriff will come out and aid you in recovering that equipment. And then there are secured party sales. Again, this remedy is available if you have a contractual right to have a security interest. Often you'll see with these contractual rights, the contract gives you the right, but there's gonna be a statute governing how you go about um, exercising this right. And with respect to secured party sales, the UCC requires that every aspect of the sale must be commercially reasonable. In almost every instance, you're required to give notice of the sale. Every aspect of the notice must be commercially reasonable, the manner, the content, and the timing. The statute governs all aspects. It must be authenticated. It must be in writing. The statute tells you who must receive notice. Typically, that is your borrower, any co-obligors, anyone who has advised the secured party of having an interest in the collateral, and anybody else who has a filed UCC. Now, how do you determine who has a filed UCC and it, that is required to receive notice. There is a safe harbor under the, UC, under the UCC. That provides that if you conduct a search within 20 to 30 days prior to giving the notice, if you provide notice to everybody that shows up on that search, you have been deemed to give commercially reasonable notice. Now, when it comes to conducting the search, looking on a state's uh, website, Secretary of State website is not sufficient. If you've all been on there, you've all seen the multiple disclaimers um, that those sites have. You cannot rely on them. You must order an official search from the Secretary of State or from a service such as CT Corp. The information that, can, that must be contained in the notice is governed by the statute. It must identify the secured party and the debtor. It must describe the collateral. It must identify when and how the, the collateral is being disposed of the timing of the notice. It must occur with at least within 10 days of the disposition and the delivery of the notice. The statute says that it just needs to occur in a commercially reasonable manner. This means if you even send the notice out by regular US mail, that would be reasonable. However, I will tell you the best practice is, is to send that notice out in a way that is trackable, FedEx certified mail. So then that way you know it, got, it was sent and it got there. Now, when it comes to the actual disposition of the collateral, whether it's public or private, again, it must be commercially reasonable in meaning that the sale must be conducted in the usual manner at market prices and in conformance with industry standards. Here, um, industry standards, usual manner is going to vary based upon what type of collateral you're liquidating. You're going to liquidate um, equipment differently than you liquidate stocks. And at market prices, if you conduct a... Um, a commercially reasonable sale, the highest bid is going to be deemed market price because that's what the market bears. If you're conducting a public sale, it's highly recommended that you get a appraisal so that you can establish a market, that there is a mark, that the market price has been achieved. When it comes to title collateral, the UCC doesn't apply. As you know, you must have your lien noted not only on the title, but when it comes to the security agreement, your collateral should be specifically identified. When it comes to repossessing, and disposing of the collateral, while the UCC does not apply, you should use that as a guidance for how to go about doing that. Set-offs, this is probably the easiest and the greatest tool available to lenders. As most of you know, a set-off is going to be a contractual right that allows a creditor to set off an account in the name of the obligor against those obligor's obligations. Now this right can arise in the loan documents themselves or if you pull back and look at the agreement that was signed by the account holder when the account was op opened, you will see that the remedy is often made available there. So there's two ways for you to find this contractual right. 
And the great thing about this contractual right is there's no intervening statutes that show you how to go about doing it. You just have to do it in compliance with uh, whatever is written in your agreement. Now, if you get to the point where what's available to you via your, con your contracts isn't enough, you want to make, your, make available various statutory remedies and once you can go out and get a judgment. And once you obtain a judgment, there, it opens up a whole another avenue of collection rights. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because if you're obtaining a judgment, you're gonna have your own counsel and they're going to advise you um, be, specifically based upon your circumstances, but you need to give some consideration to jurisdiction and venue. Are you in state and federal court? Typically, you're only gonna be in federal court if the lender and the borrower or the debtors are in a diff are in different states and the amount at issue is more than $75,000. Venue considerations, what county do you wanna be in? or what county can you be in? Often you're, you're more limited than you have choices. There are three types of judgments. There are the Cognova judgments, the default judgments, and the regular judgments. The Cognova or confession of judgments are those judgments that you take either on the day of or within a few days of filing a complaint. There's very few states that allow for Cognova judgments, but you should be aware that if you are taking a Cognova judgment, each state has its own statute, each state has its own specific requirements, and you must follow those requirements to a T. So you'll be working with your own with your own counsel to make sure that that is satisfied. And that's something you not only need to be aware of at the collection stage, but you need to be aware of it, one, at origination, but if it wasn't taken care of at origination, when you're at the stage where Brian Farkas was talking about where you're doing loan modifications or forbearance agreements, this is the time to clean it up and to make sure you follow those statutes like T. Default judgments occur when uh, the defendant fails to answer, and regular judgments is when it winds its way through the normal course and you get a judgment even either after a trial occurs or a dispositive motion is filed. It doesn't matter what type of judgment you obtain, the remedies are all the same that are available to you. One thing to think of though, before you start to select your remedies, what do you know about your borrower? Often your loan file is going to obtain the various information that's going to help you select the best way forward in, in exercising your rights and remedies and collecting that judgment. However, if you find that your loan file is a little bit on the lean side, there are post judgment um, due diligence, if you will, that you could do. You can conduct debtors examinations. Uh, Civil Rule 69 allows you not only to depose and obtain written information or reports from your, from the debtor, him or herself or itself, you can also go to third parties. You can seek information from their accountants, their bookkeepers, their, cons their customers, their vendors, whoever you think is in a position to provide you information about the financial condition of the debtor and the debtor's assets. I will caution you about reaching out to third parties such as vendors and customers. If your debtor is a going concern and your ability to get payment depends on that debtor continuing to be a going concern, think about what is going to be the impact of filing um, a, a, a Rule 69 motion on a, on a customer or a vendor. Are they going to stop doing business with this debtor? And, is, and if they do, how, how is that going to harm that that debtor's business and how is it going to harm your collection efforts you know so you need to think strategically before you start firing off motions in aid of execution once you completed your due diligence then you're in a position to consider the remedies available one of the obvious ones and it's i call it one of the low-hanging fruits are garnishments these are bank garnishments accounts receivables invoice contract payments one thing to keep in mind with bank garnishments and similar garnishments, they're, they're what I call the one hit wonders. You get one shot at it. If the day that your garnishment hits the bank account and there's not a dollar in that bank account, you get nothing. And then if $100,000 pours in a week later, it's not subject to your garnishment. That's why oftentimes you'll see multiple garnishment pleadings being filed in the same action. There's no standing order, order of garnishment like you would see with the wage garnishments. Wage garnishments are orders from the court directing the debtor's employer to, to pay you money out of each paycheck until you're paid in full. You need to keep in mind that the statutes governing wage garnishments vary state to state and you need to comply with them. You also have to keep in mind that the Consumer Credit Protection Act applies and that you only get a portion of the wages. You don't get everything. 
a certificate of judgment. This is what you're going to file in a county where your debtor owns real property or has tenements. It's going to put a lien. It's going to encumber that real property. A common mistake that I see lenders or creditors make is they have a judgment. They think they automatically get a lien. No, you have a judgment. You have a right to collect, but you don't have a lien. You have to have that certificate of judgment, and the certificate of judgment must be filed in the county where the land exists. If, if your debtor owns real property in multiple counties, you have to file multiple certificates of judgments. Writs of execution. These are going to allow you to um, basically liquidate um, items such as equipment, inventory, cash, cash receipts. And what they do is you obtain an order from the court that directs the sheriff to go out and to seize the property and liquidate it for your benefit or to tag the property and later on liquidate it for your benefit. One thing to note, with writs of execution, you only get the money if the if the if the item if the asset is free and clear. If you liquidate, and it's subject to um, a security interest, that security interest is going to take priority, and you just uh, achieved a paycheck for that secured party. Um, writs of execution on memberships and partnership interests. This is a charging order, and what that is is it's an order on a judgment on an LLC or a partnership that a judgment debtor has an interest in. And it orders that LLC or partnership to pay any distribution that the partner or member is entitled to, to the creditor. You need to note that um, this doesn't give you control over the membership and it, um, and it, uh, it doesn't uh, allow you to participate in the management. Be careful with this remedy. There are a number of states out there that say that this is an exclusive remedy. So once you take it, it prevents you from pursuing garnishments, et cetera, whatever. If you're sitting in one of those states, make sure this is your last resort. And finally, if the regular, um, if, if the regular course of action doesn't work, there's always a creditor bill. This is a separate equitable action. You file a separate complaint, and this is what's going to allow you to reach out and collect on stuff that's normally not available to a judgment creditor. Um, if, if you want to um, go ahead and, and get the distributions that would be paid to the debtor on shares that it owns, a creditor bill would be a way about going that. Um, I ran through a lot very, very quickly. I, I, I left off a lot of details. Um, everybody here at Voice always welcomes questions. We welcome questions after we uh, conclude these seminars. So please, you know, if, if we don't get to your question, if we wrap up before, and, and we left some things unanswered for you, please feel free to, an to reach out to any one of us. We're all happy to respond to emails and to take phone calls to answer your general questions. And also, e even if it's not one of us that's presenting today, any board's attorneys would be happy to, uh, to, uh, to aid you. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator. All right, at this time, we have a couple minutes where we uh, will welcome any questions. You can type a question for our speakers into the private Q&A widget on your screen. Since we are limited on time, we most likely won't be able to get to every question, but we will follow up after the presentation. And as Carrie said, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters or your Vori's attorney with any questions after today's presentation. Um, I, in looking at the Q&A box, um, John Hecker uh, brought up a good point about when the loan is transferred over into workout, um, make sure that the bank is speaking with one voice. Um, that can be a problem when the borrower calls his original, his or her original relationship manager, and there's also a spe special assets manager involved. Make sure there's only one point of contact and that everybody at the bank knows who that bank of contact is so that the bank is only speaking with one voice to its borrower. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions. Brian, this is Nikki. I, here's a question I think that is a, is a great question that um, likely is a carry answer. It relates to LIBOR, but the question is this, because we talked about LIBOR transition and timing, is it necessary to address the upcoming changes in LIBOR if I'm going to, to seek a judgment very soon? So Carrie, we actually talked about this right before the call. Do you want to share with the, the audience um, your perspective on that? Right. Even if you think you're on the cusp of obtaining a judgment, it's still 
may be in your interest to go ahead and, and and look to see how is your bank addressing the LIBOR? Do I need to get the the you know the hardwired language in there and in the replacement language in there? And and I would say yes. More often than not, with commercial loans, often when we go and obtain judgment, we would obtain judgment not at the statutory um, post judgment rate, but oftentimes we will obtain judgment at the at the interest rate that is stated in the note. And even with the free fall of LIBOR and all the other indexes, the, the, the rate stated in the note with the floors and that built in are gonna be higher than your statutory rate. If you go and you obtain a judgment and it's at the note rate, what are you gonna do with that judgment if the index is set at LIBOR? It, the, you, you're gonna to have to go in and you're gonna to have to amend your judgment, which is gonna be way more difficult than amending your loan documents on the front side. All right, everyone, that is all the time we have for today. If you had a question that did not get answered, please reach out to Brian, Nikki, or Carrie directly. We will do our best to follow up on questions that were submitted. The next webinar in this commercial loan workout webinar series will be at noon on June 3rd, and it will focus on lender liability issues. You can register for this webinar or any upcoming webinar in the series by going to voris.com and clicking on news and events. We want to thank everyone for joining us today. This concludes our program. Please take care.